So, welcome. My name is Michael Pewitt, and together with Robert Weller, I've been honored to run for several years the Chinese Religion Seminar. Rob and I have been doing this, bringing in top-tier scholars to rethink the field of Chinese religions. This has been done with the generous support of the Fairbank Center, and I am honored to say for today's discussion, we are also honored to be joined by the Asia Center, which is making possible this wonderful hybrid event. And for this reason, also we are joined by James, James Robeson, the director of the Asia Center, who be helping out with the discussion and the inevitable mistakes that I'll be making in terms of any technical issues. So with that, let me say a few quick words about Vincent, and then we will turn things over to James, who will run the actual session. So we take the moment to embarrass Vincent horribly. So as you all know, and he's been a long guest of the Chinese Religion Seminar, Vincent Gousser, our guest for today, is one of the leading scholars in the world for the study of Chinese religions. He is well known for several things. Um, one thing is for every single topic he enters, he will look at materials that no one else has looked at, often juxtapose them with other materials, either that no one has looked at or certainly no one has thought of in terms of the juxtaposition he is giving, and asking questions of them that no one ever has asked before. Moreover, and I think this is directly related to why he's always able to ask these new questions, Vincent never loses the forest for the trees. He is one of the rare scholars who works across the entire field of Chinese religions, literally for 2,000 years, looking at antiquity right up to until the present day. He is able to ask long-term questions about the history of Chinese religions. He is able to see the significance of these materials that, again, many of us don't even pay attention to because we don't understand their importance. Moreover, he is extremely well read in the field of the history of religions more generally, he is always asking how can we bring theories and approaches from the study of religions to our understanding of Chinese religions, and always asking the other way as well. How can we rethink the field of religious studies once we take the material from China seriously? He is, in short, a perfect figure for the Chinese Religion Seminar. He has therefore been a repeated guest, and we are deeply appreciative that you've come so many times to join us. And we are very honored for our first hybrid event to welcome him back. And with that as a horribly embarrassing introduction, I'm sure, let me, <laughs> let me turn things over to James, who is the director of the Asia Center. And James will be actually saying a few words and then we'll be actually guiding the, the overall process. So James, thank okay, you so thanks. much. Thanks, Michael. Um, so uh, welcome to everybody who's logged on uh, via uh, the Zoom format. And so uh, I just wanted to say a few words just about the format today, because this is our first attempt to use a kind of a hybrid format, probably something we'll be doing going forward uh, into, the, into the fall as well. Um, so the way this will work is that uh, after Professor Gussart uh, gives his talk, there'll be uh, time for Q&A. Uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on Zoom to raise your hand. Uh, but rather than type your question, you can also type your question into the Q&A function if you would like. But if you raise your hand, I will then call on people and, and you will have to unmute yourself and then you will be able to ask the question orally of Professor Gussart. OK, so I'll recognize people as they appear in the in the queue on the uh, on Zoom, and then we'll uh, let you ask your question. So uh, I'll remind people when we get to that uh, how that'll how that'll function. But um, that's uh, and please bear with us if there's any kind of uh, slight technical glitches uh, today. Uh, please uh, be understanding. This is our first attempt to do this, um, and I would like to uh, say a special thanks to the Asia Center staff, particularly uh, Tenzin Nodaf and Jorge Espada, for their help in. Uh, setting all of this uh, up today. And thanks, Michael, for uh, having this uh, being sponsored through the Chinese Religion Seminar at the Fairbank Center. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's uh, turn things over to Vincent for uh, his talk entitled The Social Networks of the Gods and Late Imperial Spirit Writing Altars. And I turn the mic over to you, Professor Gussard. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. This, this is my first uh, transcontinental trip for the, over the last uh, three years and being uh, uh, hosted here at Harvard is uh, extremely exciting and a great way to uh, try to uh, 
embark on the, uh, the the new normal life of uh, traveling again and, and meeting with uh, old friends and new friends. So I'm really uh, grateful to the uh, the, the Farabong Center and the uh, Arab University Asia Center for uh, hosting this talk, and to uh, Michael and and James for uh, inviting me to uh, to talk with you about uh, a really very recent and uh, uh, ongoing uh, research project. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with, if I can get this to, yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, to, uh, a very brief introduction of the more general question uh, as a sort of a framework in which I try to place this uh, talk, and then I will uh, uh, hopefully quickly get to the details of the data and the way I try to analyze it. So the, the general um, framework is, as Michael said, uh, my um, work over the last uh, 30 years in the history of Chinese religion and trying to understand conceptions and practices of divine entities in a Chinese cultural concept and the type of relationship that Chinese people add and have with the gods. And maybe more specifically, uh, one of the questions behind this, this research project is how to study a god or a cult. Because it is my impression that even there's been quite a lot of excellent work published over the, 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 the most recent decades about Chinese gods in a, in a more encompassing sense of the word, uh, I think that most of them are actually studies of cults, that is what kind of people worship this or that god, uh, what are their intentions for and what, what are the, game, the aim and goals for worshiping these gods and what kind of uh, identities and value would the project on the gods. And I think there are fewer studies, there are some certainly, but there are fewer studies about God as gods, as entities, and how do we study entities. And I think the field of Chinese religion has not gone so much forward uh, with that kind of a fundamental question. What is a god and how do we study a god, in, not independently of the cult, but as a decent research question from what is a cult. And uh, this leads us to the problem of how the field of Chinese uh, religious history may enter into dialogue with more uh, uh, recent anthropological theories on gods and much more generally on non-humans. And as I think most of you know, uh, there are lots of uh, recent, uh, very exciting uh, theoretical and empirical work done by anthropologists on non-humans. But I think that little of that really seriously considered the Chinese evidence. And this is not an isolated phenomenon. I think in the humanities and social science in general, many theories do not really, um, are not built with uh, much uh, Chinese material in them. And then only at a later stage try to uh, apply themselves to the Chinese case, but there is little uh, Chinese uh, feedback or input into the theory. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that what I'm trying to do will put the Chinese uh, religious culture back into the center of anthropological theory. I have certainly never attempted to do such a thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, be part of that kind of uh, dialogue. So what uh, kind of sources uh, do I use to uh, try to address these very large questions? I, for this particular uh, project, it's mostly late, late imperial and modern sources. And I try to work within a triangle of sources, stories, stories of interaction between humans and non-humans, including God, spirits, and all kinds of entities, that, such as we may find in narrative accounts like Pichi Xiaoshuo, novels, anecdotes, miracle tales, and so on and so forth. So stories of events. Um, liturgy, in prescriptive descriptions of what, how people should interact with gods and other entities. And the contents of what comes out of those encounters, especially a revelation. And I'm actually uh, working on a revealed uh, literature especially but not uh, uniquely uh, uh, from spread writing right and it is within that triangle who how and what that i'm trying to understand the kind of uh, a human god relationship that are built uh, through these rituals and through the telling and retelling of these uh, of the accounts of these uh, encounters 
Uh, one of the major uh, anthropological theories that have been used to discuss non-humans and how humans relate to non-humans over the last uh, maybe two or three decades is, of course, the, uh, the ontologies and, and, and uh, my uh, fellow countryman, Philippe Descola, has contributed uh, a very powerful uh, theoretical uh, discussions on how we, uh, different human cultures think about non-humans, you know, including God, spirits, and, and other entities. And of course, this has spurred uh, a lot of interest and, and, and uh, help, uh, pushed many scholars to think afresh what a god or a spirit is. But I am not using this not in a, uh, as a sort of a rejection of a theory which I, uh, one would uh, think, think of as um, flow is not at all the case. But I think for the kind of evidence I'm working this, this is the, uh, the Scorpion ontologies are not working very well because in the course of human spirit interaction, I see a lot of change in ontological status of those entities, either by the own initiative of uh, uh, humans or non-humans, and also by the ritual production of new ontological status for those entities. And because I am interested in the change of ontological status, the, the, the Scorpion model doesn't work so very well for my own uh, purposes, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not rejecting it. I, I just say that I'm trying to do something else. And I'm looking at changes in, in uh, ontological status at different degrees. The first is individuation of uh, something, a spirit that is somehow affecting human lives in a good or bad way, may be first individuated, made distinct, from other entities, like the spirit of that place, of that tree, distinct from other spirits. Uh, Further than that, there is a process of subjectivation where entities are expressed or are given uh, the means to express their interiority, that is their own will or desire or effects. Right? And that may include objects. Uh, there are, we have many stories in the Chinese religious history of objects that do things, that act out of their own will, like statues, bells, and then other objects that uh, interact with humans out of their own initiative. So they have interiority. But further, even further than that, there is, and that's what I'm most interested in, uh, certain of these uh, entities that are become subjects and have interiority take one step further and speak in their own name. Let's say they give themselves a name and they talk about themselves, they explain who they are and why they are doing things and why they want to interact with humans and, 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 and uh, their, their hopes and, 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 and ambitions in their interactions with, with humans. And that's projects of subjectivation of entity spirit is what I'm really looking at in this project. And this is very closely linked to humanization. Right? That's, Chinese religious cultures has many uh, uh, ways and means to make things become humanized, even though at the same time as they retain something of their originally non-human nature, right? Like uh, just to throw an example, the, the famous story of the stone, right? Who becomes a, this uh, a, a fictional hero, Jabba, in, in, in a Hong Roman, and becomes very human, actually extremely human, as human as one can be, over human, maybe, uh, at the same time as it or he remains a stone. Uh, and this actually, uh, we can also think of all the, the debates uh, in both state regulation and social debates about uh, certain type of gods and the question of whether they are human and non-humans, like are the city gods who make, uh, are treated by some people as the uh, uh, divinized spirit of a given uh, historical figure, and at the same time is treated by the state as, as a non-human, as simply uh, the spirit of the walls and, and modes of a given place. Uh, uh, Wen Chong, an extremely important god in the world of spirit writing, is at, at once at the same time um, a star, an, an, a non-human cosmic entity, and a person who talks about his own previous life and was a, a very uh, a clear and unique uh, uh, personality, right? So lots of those uh, entities that uh, <clears throat> uh, Chinese interact with are both at the same time human and non-humans, right? And that's what I, why I think ontologies are uh, have a problem with that kind of situation, which is not the exception, but rather the rule in, in, 
in, in Chinese religious culture. And to add to those processes of um, subjectivation and humanization uh, is the process of socialization, creating bonds and links between different entities, both human and non-human. And uh, there are ritual processes to help entities uh, subjectivate themselves, humanize themselves, and socialize uh, as part of the same process. And that's why I'm going to use the, the tool of a, a social network analysis to understand how certain entities uh, subjectify themselves and, and humanize themselves and enter into those uh, long-term intense relationship with, with humans. Uh, so in order to give those uh, spirits, entities, whatever you call them, the possibility to express themselves, to subjectify themselves, then they need mediation. Humans do that, of course, and they usually don't need mediation. Humans can usually talk for themselves and, and express themselves. Um, entities, invisible entities, need mediation, and there are all kinds of different means uh, in Chinese and also in older uh, cultures to help entities express themselves. Um, now, all kinds of ritual modes when a spirit manifests itself, usually a ritual specialist, Taoist, Buddhist, medium, sectarian leaders, and so on and so forth, uh, called to uh, manage the interaction and, and, and question themselves. So, who is the, one of the first question in the session of exorcism or you know, interaction with, with those entities? Who are it's questioning? Who are you? What is your story? What is your name? Where do you come from? And this may be done through spirit mediums, through dreams, through visualization, through spirit writing and other means. And I try to discuss this in a book, the cover of which you can see on the slide, and which will, which is uh, uh, forthcoming from uh, from here, from the Asia Center, in a couple of months. And uh, actually, this is not a, a book talk, and the uh, the whole uh, social network analysis, and I'm going to get to in a moment is not in the book, but the, uh, the, the, uh, it's a further development from the history of those ways of making uh, gods speak and express themselves that I described in the book. But I am um, trying to, in this new project, in this talk, I'm trying to, to go one step further. So very briefly, um, try to define the term I use, and this is just, it's not meant to be, a, a, of course, a, a general definition valid for a, each and every uh, research project on, on Chinese religion, but it's just my own, uh, the, own the way I, I, I define terms for my, for my own purposes here. So I, I use spirit as the most encompassing term, right? Uh, entities that, uh, whose existence is known by experience, where maybe the visions, hearing, uh, the things, the object that moves, and, and so on and so forth. And that they, for the last, for the most part, uh, not, we don't know anything about them, right? We know there is a spirit, but we don't know what they are. I mean, ontologically speaking, we don't know uh, what they want, right? Uh, and then some of them uh, can become subject. They express themselves. They, they let others know uh, who they are, what their name is, uh, what they want, right? And some of them are humans, of course. Some of them are animals. So we can see some animals get subjectified and talk for themselves, but not all of them, probably not most of them. And it's the same for gods, actually. The, my category of gods straddle this category between sub subjectified spirit and non-subjectified spirits. Um, and I'm going to explain this in a, in a, in a second. Uh, but I think this chart may be useful if we uh, uh, use it to try to trace processes of, of transformation, especially subjectivation. And just to take the example of a, a fox spirit, which is a, a very uh, well-known, well-studied by uh, people from uh, like uh, Kong Xiaofei and others, um, uh, through both uh, literary uh, accounts uh, in uh, early modern and, and later imperial sources, but also from ethnography. The, the cult of a uh, fox spirit is still uh, very much alive uh, in the 21st century. And it's very often the case that uh, there's something happens. There's a, a possession or a good or bad event. So, uh, you know, money appears or money disappears, things move and so on and so forth. And uh, so we know there is a spirit, but we don't know what it is. And then a, a medium is called on and through the medium, the spirit explained that it is a fox spirit. So it becomes identified as, as an animal uh, entity, and then it may, in some cases, um, subjectify itself. So it's given, it gives itself a name, so it's given a name, 
uh, uh, and uh, an history and uh, aims and purposes and so forth. And in some cases, it be even becomes humanized at the same time as it remains its uh, foxy identity, but is as a statue the, uh, with a human uh, body, a human name, a human history, and so on and so forth. Right? And well, at all, at, as, as part of that process, it becomes subjectified and humanized, but it remains a fox at the same time. So, it, like, its family name would be Hu or something like this. So, it's both, uh, at, at the end result of that process, it becomes both uh, a subjectified human and a fox. And we also have, so I just showed that gods may go, go through the same process because we have uh, la numerous categories of gods that are generic categories of unnamed small gods, right? They, they might be um, uh, individualized in terms of like, might be the earth spirit of that village or the, uh, the, 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 the mountain spirit of that little hill, right? So you're different from other uh, generic uh, earth god or mountain gods or river gods or dragon kings and so on and so forth, but you don't have still, you don't have a name, you don't have an identity, you don't have a story. Um, so that many of the, the gods Chinese interact with are prey to are those unnamed small gods, They're not subjectified yet, but they may get subjectified, and in, in many cases they do uh, get subjectified, well they subjectify themselves to be more, to speak more accurately, through again spirit mediums, dreams, uh, spirit writing, and, and so on and so forth, right? So I end up going through these categories, but you or uh, probably are all familiar with those, right? Earth God, Dragon Kings, uh, the female lady is helping with, you know, uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, baby delivery, and, and, and early uh, childhood illnesses, and so on and so forth. Um, the ones are all the, uh, the small gods doing the, uh, the, the clerical work uh, for the rituals, right? the, the, the processing the paperwork, the leaving the uh, uh, civil and martial spirit at the service of the priest. Uh, most of them unnamed generic, but in some cases they do express themselves and, they, and then they become identified and, and subjectified. Okay, so one now uh, to uh, sort of uh, focus a little bit more on the, uh, on, on, the, on the topic of this talk. Uh, one of the ways, and I've mentioned spirit possession and dreams and, and other ways of uh, making the uh, spirits express themselves and subjectify themselves. So I'm, I'm putting this aside. This is, of course, all of those means are extremely important and they are all ritually produced, including dreams. But uh, I'm going to focus on one particular uh, uh, ritual uh, technique for making the gods uh, speak and express themselves, and that's spirit writing. So probably most of you are uh, uh, some knowledge of uh, what spirit writing is. This is an old picture taken in, a, in a, a condominium apartment in Hong Kong that was turned into a small uh, spirit writing shrine. Uh, so this is a very just to show this is a very uh, uh, a living and a, a very uh, vibrant tradition in many parts of the Chinese world. Uh, the spirit writing is a whole family of ritual. It's not one uh, monolithic thing. It's just, there are all kinds of uh, ritual techniques for uh, doing spirit writing, many different terms. Jiang Bi, Fei Wan, Fuji are three of the most common, but there are thousands more terms to um, uh, refer to specific traditions of spirit writing. It appears around the, the uh, 11th century and it involves. Uh, a personal relationship between humans that gods accept as their disciples, these, uh, and what I call salvational gods, gods that come not just for you know answering questions or providing a sort of one-off help, but are there to help humanity through the, the chosen ones they take as disciples to save them. There is a very strong eschatological inspiration throughout the history of spirit writing. Of course, in some spirit writing groups and, 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 and texts, this is less in evidence. It's, it's always there in the background. And in a good many cases, it's very much in the foreground. It's, it's the very reason why the gods uh, take humans as disciples and interact with them is to save humanity from the brink of the uh, uh, upcoming apocalypse. And uh, spirit writing is an extremely effective way to give a voice to a huge number of different spirits from the highest uh, gods known throughout the Chinese cultural world to small, uh, small spirits that were either too uh, unknown or at least unnamed 
and that through thread writing may uh, get to express themselves and subjectify themselves. So thread writing uh, is a way to create a social bonds, what we might call the society of the gods and society between gods and humans. Uh, because thread writing creates an, uh, what is not necessarily always, but what is very often an intense emotional sociability between the actors, so it's between humans and gods, gods and their human disciples, but also in certain cases between the gods themselves, right? So this creates a whole society uh, that is fed by um, deep interaction, uh, discussions about uh, individual destinies, individual aspiration, very strongly in effect. It's not, of course, there is doctrinal content, and in, in the book I talk about the house writing produce new ideas, new, new um, uh, doctrines, and that's extremely important as well, of course, but this is not what I'm going I'm trying to talk about in this particular uh, presentation. What I look at today is the, uh, the uh, personal, emotional involvement of those entities that take part in the interaction uh, through spray writing on both sides, right? Uh, uh, blood and flesh humans and uh, uh, otherwise invisible uh, gods. Um, and because there is this strong emotional content and, 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 and personal bonds, the divine persona of the entities that are made to, to speak and express themselves grow stronger as they have their social network expands. I mean, the, the more different people they talk to and the more, the more uh, different gods they interact with, the more their divine persona gets um, coherent, complex, uh, uh, and compelling. And that's something I'm, I'm really interested in. How the creation, the ritual creation of divine persona, how do you create a god, in some cases just out of nothing else, just a, a, a very small scale event, and something happens, and, and, and ritually out of that, uh, through spirit writing and other means, uh, people who act as the, uh, the, the the mediums in the latter sense, including through spirit writing, help these entity become a, a full-fledged divine persona with a strong and unique personality. And this involved a wide range of uh, entities and, and of theological categories that we might want uh, as uh, scholars of religious history to put them in. Of course, there are many deified humans and you, you might think of course this this all spirit writing thing it's it's about humans talking with dead humans and you know know that in chinese religious culture death is a rather porous boundary and the, 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 you know, talk to the dead and uh, okay but that's certainly the case that spirit writing helps people co keep communicating with their uh, deceased uh, loved ones that's one of its many uh, functions. But we uh, should also pay attention to the fact that uh, the uh, divine entities that humans interact with through spirit writing also include entities that we might hardly consider as fundamentally human. Uh, so this is the example of a, uh, and you see an illustration of him on, on the right hand side, uh, Wang Lingguan, with the fierce uh, law, divine law enforcer. Uh, the guardian of Taoist uh, temples and monasteries, the uh, god to which all people who receive a Taoist ordination make an oath, right? and the god who punishes and often by death. Uh, people who break their vows, who are uh, 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 break the rules of purity during pilgrimages, etc., and so on and so forth. So it is a very a fearful law enforcer, and he has a whole lore. Uh, he's an important god in many uh, I mean, novels, theater plays, and other uh, Bao Juan and other sources about it. But uh, it almost never in those sources we are told about a human life. Of so he's, he has a name, he's, he's very subjectified, he's, he talks for himself, but he, he never talks about his once being a human. Uh, and and uh, uh, just to give another uh, short example, Yosho Yuan was the, the assistant, the, the, the number two <laughs> uh, of Lu Zhu Patriarch Xu, Lu Dongbin, the immortal Lu Dongbin, uh, very, very quite clearly was first a tree spirit, 
saved by Le Dong Bin into an, uh, and, and, and will become an immortal. And eventually, at a very late point in the 19th century, uh, Spirit wrote a text saying that, yes, he was also once a human, but fundamentally, he's, he's a wheel of tree, as his family name says quite clearly, right? So we have entities of very different natures, but that engage in the same society, in the, in the same uh, social networks of uh, interactions. Um, and so if we look at these entities not as belonging to different categories, like humans, non-humans, or God, spirit, animals, whatever, but simply as nodes in, in one uh, in, in a single set of uh, network, then uh, we come across quite naturally a, another major uh, recent anthropological theory, which is the actor network theory, from developed uh, among other scholars by uh, another of my uh, fellow countrymen, Bruno Latour. Um, and I was when I, I, I got into this uh, research project, first uh, thought that this was wonderful because I could, you know, uh, use this theory and enter into a dialogue with all the anthropologists uh, thinking about the humans in terms of a uh, uh, actor network theory. And then I read a, a number of things, and even and and sort of, you know, uh, going back into the uh, you know ontological turn in anthropological theory. And the questions of how do we think of non-humans, but then I realized that this is not again for my particular purposes here. This does not work so very well either, because what actor network theory actually does is trying to look at uh, actors in networks that are not subject, that do not have interiority but that nonetheless play a crucial role, role in the functioning of networks, like objects. Right? And, and for instance, a, a, a typical actor network theory of analysis would take the brush or you know, the wooden writing implement as an important actor. And I think that's entirely valid and very interesting. Interesting, but that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is precisely actually the opposite of what actor network theory is doing. And I'm trying to look at how non-subjectified actants without interiority are given interiority and subjectivity. Because the networks ritually produced by spread writing actually mostly include subject. They are all about entities talking about themselves and asserting that subjectivity as part as the network, and the network helped them to do that. Right? So again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all rejecting this, this theory, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at networks in a, in a probably rather different way than uh, most uh, anthropologists and sociologists that are using this uh, ANT. Because in, in some anthropological writing, the network is a metaphor. Right? But actually, a network can also be a formal model. Um, and, and more interesting in that, looking at the form, formal model rather than this, talking about networks as metaphors of uh, when discussing interaction between humans and non humans. And uh, I have another uh, issue with that theory is that. Uh, people using the language, scholars using the language of the actor network theory tend to, not necessarily, but I think tend to deny that there is something uh, uh, stable, permanent in a divine entity outside of its connectivity within networks, right? And that, for instance, the case of uh, Bernard Faux and his absolutely uh, fantastic work on the gods of medieval Japan, and in, in, in this book or series of books, more precisely, it, it tries to do some of the same thing that I'm trying to do with my Chinese uh, spread writing gods. Uh, and he's, he's using this language of uh, actor network theory, saying that gods are not di di uh, independent things that are stable, that they are uh, nodes that are constantly uh, reshaped and, and transformed by the bonds they create with other nodes in all kinds of networks, which are reproduced. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not claiming the one is right and the other is wrong. I think it's different ways of looking at the creation of divine persona. But what I see from my, then quite likely it's just a bias introduced by the kind of material I use, but what I see is stable, coherent, divine persona created by uh, the mediation of um, spread writing uh, 
specialist, among other uh, retail specialists, and that um, do not dissolve or uh, in, uh, as they uh, create more connection with other gods, but to the opposite, reinforce their unique, specific uh, divine persona through the, 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 the many bonds that they create with humans and with other gods. And of course, this is not denying that gods are different for different social groups or different local contexts or, or different even uh, social contexts or for inviting the gods. But I still think that there is, uh, in, in most cases for the, for the Chinese god, a sort of a stable, solid core that is consistently reinforced by the very fact of making them speak for themselves or subjectify themselves through spirit writing and other means. And just to give you an example, from Guandi was one of the most important spirit writing gods in Li and, and modern China. We see what we see with, with Guandi, and we have really a massive amounts of discourses and interventions by Guandi, uh, both uh, texts revealed by Guandi and stories about Guandi. Uh, you know, be making itself present and, 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 and talking for himself. And in many, many cases, we see Gwendi beginning by uh, reminding people of, you know, who he was. You know, I was born in the late Han, and then I, I scored this host was in Liu Bei, and, 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 and I was, uh, you know, loyal and so on and so forth. And that is often surprising because you would think people know that. It's, it's, it's just repeating the, uh, the obvious. But this is actually, these texts are not about conveying new information, it's about constantly reinforcing and, 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 and continuing to uh, reaffirm this unique personality that he has, this unique divine persona. And gods also have a unique style of expression. Even when you don't know what God is talking from, from reading their uh, the kind of text they write in the, in the first person, you would identify them just as you identify the writing style of your colleagues. You say, oh, well, this is, oh, that must be from Michael Pewitt, right? And you're going to take an anonymous review, that kind of thing. It's the same with the gods. Usually you, you, they name themselves, you know, but even if you don't know, uh, Guan Yu has a very, very uh, definite uh, writing style. Right, so just to give you an example of the, 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 the concluding lines from one of these uh, most uh, widely uh, disseminated uh, morality book, the Zhenjing, uh, he says, uh, uh, if, you, if you betray my teaching, then you will taste of my squirt. Uh, this is typical of one d style, very direct, a little bit rough, uh, uh, martial, violent, uh, no nonsense. <laughs> Uh, and this, yeah, this is Guan Yu style, and, and Lu Zhu speaks very differently, and Guan Yin speaks differently, and so on and so forth. Okay, now to the, uh, the second part of my uh, presentation. Uh, the uh, social network analysis, or maybe even more precisely, uh, historical social network analysis. And here I have to bow to uh, my friend uh, Marcus Bingenheimer, um, was really uh, first got me into understanding the, uh, the the value and usefulness of this technique um, a number of times, and who have very kindly uh, guided me to uh, as I was uh, learning. I'm still learning the ropes of this uh, uh, of this methodology, and uh, I would like to refer uh, everyone to what Marcus has uh, published earlier. This, this is uh, taken from it's an uh, open access. Uh, data set that he has created and with his own visualization of the, net, the social networks of Buddhist monks through history. So I'm not going to commend that. We, we should ask Marcus to commend it. But this is just to show that they have been a uh, great scholar uh, using uh, SNA methodology to understand uh, uh, Chinese religious history. So what I'm uh, trying to do here is basically uh, uh, walk on his uh, footsteps, but introducing non-humans as part of the story, which of course makes the historical uh, part of it more complex because the gods tend to be uh, around for a very, very long period of time. <laughs> but that's not, actually not, not uh, really a, a, such a major uh, methodological problem. So what I'm working with is the gods expressing themselves in spirit writing outhouse, this is called Jitan, and just uh, screenshot here is just a, a sample uh, page from the uh, 
uh, vast amounts of uh, uh, collections of uh, revelations we have. You know, you know, the gods says, and then you have a poem or a short tract or just an answer to a question, so that kind of things. And this, uh, uh, this, the, the literature of this kind. Uh, is now becoming more widely available for all kinds of uh, reprints of collections. And uh, I, I should have inserted uh, an image of that here, but I just mentioned briefly that uh, we, uh, Marcus and other colleagues, including uh, Katrina Alexander and, and Gregory Scott, and I and Philippe Plaut and uh, other friends, we are, have been building an open access, actually a Wikipedia, Wiki-based uh, database called a CRTH, Chinese Religious Text Authority, uh, that map uh, the uh, Chinese uh, religious literature in general, and of course tries to make uh, provide a, a map of these uh, kind of late imperial uh, spirit written revelation as part of the, the, the larger uh, collections of uh, Chinese religious literature that are not available in the libraries or even online but are very still very well used and explored. And um, uh, all of the, uh, the text, I, the, the, the sources I use for this project and other projects are also documented in CRTA. So if you have a moment, also invite you to have a look at this database and write to us if you're interested in being associated in one way or, or another with the project. So, uh, so back to my uh, spread written uh, collections of text. Uh, I try to look into that uh, of course, for uh, uh, doctrinal contents and ideas, that, that's for sure. I just don't use them solely for uh, social network analysis. But as I, as I read them, I also try to uh, note systematically the names of uh, all the gods that intervene and try to understand the relation uh, between them. Right. So it's my approach, not purely uh, like quantitative, but in this particular token presentation, I focus on this aspect. So I, I look at the links between gods and humans, right? Is there uh, specific kinds of gods, um, like one that we may call like Buddhist or Taoist or sectarians or locals or whatever, um, uh, that have particular link to particular groups of people, the historical context, are the gods the same in, in, in Sichuan or, in, or Cantonese world or Jiangnan or Beijing? Uh, but also, I also look at the links between the gods themselves in terms of complementarity, what god would come naturally along with some other gods, their division of labor, their affinities or lack of affinities. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to look at, uh, well, all kinds of uh, spirit written uh, texts, but I, I especially focus on text where we have a good number of different gods that intervene at the same author, not necessarily at the same time. Some authors uh, uh, publish revelation that straddle over several decades. Well, so not all the gods are co-present the same day necessarily, but they have all intervened with the same set of people. So I have 13 authors here, and I'm certainly not going to read and comment this, but just to uh, say briefly that some others just have a, a couple dozen gods, and some have as many as uh, 133, so different sizes. Uh, my uh, corpus, and I'm certainly uh, aiming to expand that corpus, but this is preliminary, but it's already quite enough to give an idea of what we can do with that kind of data. Uh, I've, I've been uh, selecting uh, data from different parts of the Chinese world, so like in Northern China, Jiangnan, uh, South Western China, and also different time period from the late Ming to the uh, very late Qing. Uh, this is what the data set looks. I'm not going to comment this either. It's, it's simple uh, Excel spreadsheets. I have problems in identifying gods, but I'm not going to comment that too much. I don't factor here the relative importance. Of course, we have others. We have one central god that speaks every day, and that certain gods may just come once, right? But I'm, I'm not factoring this in, maybe at a later stage. I don't look too much at chronology. And in, in nutshell, I have uh, four, almost 500 gods and almost 700 links. That's God, a link is when one god intervenes at one author, that's a link between uh, this god and this author, okay? Uh, and I've categorized gods, and, and this might look very uh, weird and, and, and random. It's absolutely not a sort of general typology of Chinese God at all. It's just types of God that have 
clearly uh, uh, strong affinity or connection with each other, and that come up quite often in my focus in the spread writing others. In other contexts, these categories would be irrelevant or completely marginal, of course. But for my purpose, these are the kind of gods that I see often. Uh, but of course, many gods cannot be uh, assigned to a category. Yeah, like Zhong Xian, Evoto Zhong speaks. That can be anything. It can be a false spirit. It can be the grandfather of the guy wielding the, the, the phoenix. It can be a, it can, can be a man, can be a woman, can be anything, right? So I don't categorize that. But when we know something about these gods, then I put them into one of those categories. Okay, now to the fun part. Uh, when you have a data set like I just introduced of uh, so nodes, <laughs> humans and gods, and the links, then you can use uh, visual, visualization uh, software to try to look at uh, how this plays out. And I've been, again, helped uh, strongly and kindly by uh, Marcus Bienheimer using that particular uh, 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 free software called uh, Giphy. Uh, Giphy, I'm not sure how you pronounce that anyway. And uh, with that, you can, with the same data, you can do all kinds of visual, visualization. I'm going to use different ones and maybe some are more beautiful or more effective at uh, conveying information. Maybe you will tell me, but okay. This is a general visualization of the whole network, right? So each green circle is an altar, so a group of humans inviting gods, and each uh, a black node is a god. And here, the, uh, the size of the uh, of the nodes is relative to the number of connections they have with or not, right? So you, you can see that each altar, each of the 13 uh, altars, the green one, and you have their names in, in, written on them, uh, has a certain number of gods that only them, uh, only these altars is connected to. Right? And but at the center, you have more central, more important gods that are connected to many more others and other gods. Okay. Uh, and so the, the one uh, first, one of the most uh, obvious research, uh, the obvious moves you could uh, make from there is uh, ask who are those central gods, these this larger uh, nodes in the middle. And uh, uh, there's a very uh, simple request to get something like this. Where you have um, here ask, looking at gods that have at least seven connections that interact with seven different adults, seven different groups of humans in different places at different times. So we have the, the, more, the most uh, connected gods. And here, uh, for, for seven or more connections, you have six gods. And that already uh, is something, uh, it's useful. Uh, and somehow new information because you would uh, that this would draw attention to gods that actually in the uh, in the scholarship on, on spirit writing very few scholars have discussed about the th the first three are very obvious Ritsu and Chang Guanti everyone knows these are the three gods that are everywhere in spirit writing and they actually form a sort of trial so this this was completely expected. But the next three that they were much less expected that are actually very interesting. Zhong Li Xuan, so Yudu's master, uh, Wang Ling Wan, I, I mentioned him before, Thunder God, very uh, fierce, fearful enforcer of Taoist law, and Han Changzhe, who is also one of the eight immortal of the Philip Clark has written about Han Changzhe law. But here we see that in, in, in later spirit writing groups, he is a, a highly connected, highly central divine entity that was. Uh, relates to all kinds of other gods and humans and it plays a central role in the, the building up of that society of the gods with humans. And so with information like that, then of course the next move is why? And then uh, because you realize that then, then you, you can explore and I've been actually doing that with Wang Lingguan, I forced my article on him, and trying to understand why he's so important and central. And, and once you know he is important and central, then you can really find out more and understand better the way this, this society of humans and gods work. Now, this is a different kind of a, a visualization. Uh, you know, uh, tell me whether it's more or less effective or whatever. Um, and, and looking at uh, certain categories. And here, uh, it's in blue, you have the, what I call the local gods. So it's earth god, city god, Chen Huang, and other gods that are clearly identified as god of the particular place 
where the spirit writing uh, is, is, uh, is going on. And in radical dismembers, these are actually uh, members of the spirit writing authors who died and will continue to be part of it from the other side, of the <laughs> from the other world. And this is an extremely common phenomenon. All the, 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 the members, the, 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 the disciples of the spirit writing authors, and some, it's something we also know from ethnography. This is, again, a very living tradition, so we, we know that from, from fieldwork, uh, the deceased member very quickly, uh, quickly after they, they die, uh, they would write to their fellows saying, okay, no, I'm, I'm arrived, I've taken up that position in heaven, I'm going to you know, continue to look after you, and so on and so forth. Um, so that kind of entities are quite numerous and important, but as we see on this visualization, they are not well connected. This is very logical, of course. This, this doesn't come as a huge surprise, but it's it, it's it's good to have a confirmation and to, to see it. Uh, first, that these kind of entities are important in certain altars and much less in others. But in 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 any case, they are always connected to one altar. They uh, they don't travel. They don't create bonds with other gods or other people. By contrast. We have other categories here, uh, mostly uh, deceased uh, historical figures. So we have three subcategories, but they more or less behave the same in the networks. Uh, military heroes, like dead generals, uh, poets. Uh, Levi is extremely important in spirit writing cults. And not just for you know, exchanging poetry with the, the, the members. Of, he does that an awful lot. But uh, he also uh, uh, expresses himself for other purposes and in other ways. And what I call the Confucians. Uh, from Confucius itself, not common, not very common. Sometimes speaks, but not often. But uh, uh, Jushi, uh, you know, other famous thinkers. And here we see that those, these kind of gods they are much more connected. In some cases, they are only belong to one author, but we see many of them, especially the, the poets in green, right, in the center, not necessarily very highly connected, but at, connected to at least two, three different authors, which, uh, which means that they have, they have bonds that they travel, they can extend uh, 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 in, in, in different directions with different other gods and, and, and humans. And it's something interesting to think about. What role does uh, uh, apotheosized uh, historical figure play in the construction of networks between humans and, and gods? And, uh, between gods. Um, so again, this is a very preliminary talk, and I'm not giving you the, conc the whole uh, conclusion explanation of why this is so, but I'm, 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 this is something I've been doing for couple of months, basically. So I'm very uh, looking for your feedback, but I'm, I'm, I'm presenting what I think is a fact. And of course, the next step will be trying to explain this, this fact. Um, and there's a similar case, Thunder God, the Lei Shen. Um, and again, we see here that some Thunder Gods belong, or are just connected to one of my others. And of course, that may change when I add to the data set and expand the data set. But uh, here we can already see that there are a good number of thunder gods that are in the middle. And we see that thunder gods are actually important, that they, they connect gods and they connect people. And why this is so, uh, here I think I have a, a, a more uh, developed answer. Uh, it's because spirit writing itself as a ritual is uh, a sort of sub-product or part of the larger uh, history of thunder rituals. And so thunder gods intervene in that, that process quite naturally and in, in different places. And they, they travel between different authors. They connect authors, they connect the gods, they connect the humans. Again, a completely different uh, kind of visualization. That is exactly the same. I'm just playing. Really, it's really good part of this project. About playfulness. Uh, playing with different, trying to see what works better. Um, but okay, this is the, what I call this category: Buddhas and Buddhists. Uh, this is very wild because it includes both actual Buddhas, and Shakyamuni Buddhas, and others, and famous monks, but Buddhist figures. And we see that in that world of uh, uh, spirit writing practices, Buddhist entities are really quite few, and only two have uh, some sort of centrality, and that's of course Guan Yin, but it comes a bit late, but Guan Yin, and then Qigong. Uh, uh, Qigong is not highly connected here because it comes up pretty late, uh, really, in the Guangxi period, in the 18, uh, 1880s. 
uh, if we had a data set really uh, entirely modern, it would be much more central. Mm -hmm. But you see here that Buddhists are present. It's not a non-type. It's not a world that ignore Buddhist entities, but they don't play a, a central role in creating this sociability between humans and gods. Uh, eight immortals are yet another <laughs> choice of colors and relation, but uh, yet another set that is much more central. It's the eight immortals. You see that the, all eight of them are somewhere in the center. The, not all eight of them have the same uh, degree of connectivity, right? Uh, of course, Lu Zhu is the most important, and then you mentioned Zhong Yichuan. Some others are a bit less connected, but still they appear in different places. And the fact that they are Considered as a group, explain that why Luzu may intervene in one place, in one place, then he would bring along his fellow immortals, right? So this this whole question of affinities between God explain why also people uh, accept and, and engage with God that uh, they may not have uh, known or you know especially uh, liked in the first place. But these other gods are brought by their uh, uh, close connection and links with uh, gods that were uh, present before at the altar. Uh, okay, this, no, I'm not going to comment this, this to show that different, my eight different categories of gods, to see that some are present uh, in almost all altars and some in, in, in fewer altars. So that's a way to, well, not visualization, but a more statistical way of trying, again, to think about the different levels of connectivities and different types of gods. And I'm going to more or less end up with this, my last visualization. Female gods, again, um, the, the data set is a little bit limited here again, because as I mentioned before, for many, over half of my almost 500 gods, we, uh, we have extremely little information, including gender. Right? We have Li Xian, Zhang Xian. Might be male, might be female, but be androgynous, maybe neither of the none of the above, right? But for uh, entities clearly identified as gods, and even though here Lansai is highly androgynous, um, the female gods are really a minority in this uh, society of this, this particular society of the gods created spirit writing out. Of course, there are other society of the gods in different other kinds of ritual contexts. Local temples would be different. But here, this is a society that is largely male, but they are female present, just as they are. They were female members of uh, living female members of the spirit writing others. They were also uh, uh, female gods uh, being part of that society. Minority, but with a rather uh, reasonable uh, rate of connectivity, right? They are in a minority, but they are not marginal in the sense that none of them plays any significant role. Not at all the cases you can see with at least three female or partly female uh, entities in the center, right? Guani, again, of course, Lan Sanjo and, and, and Hoshingu. Okay, so my conclusion, if I have one more minute, yes. thank you. Um, I think that spread writing can be understood along with uh, 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 spirit possessions, uh, ritual production of dreams and, and other means, as a ritual mechanism to control the humans. And this controlling, in many cases, take the form of subjectivation. That it's not the humans that subjectify the, the gods. The gods are su uh, subjectifying themselves, but the humans provide them with the means, with the mediation, with the, the ritual means that uh, uh, for the gods to express themselves and so to subjectify themselves and to socialize, right? It is through this uh, ritual uh, production of uh, interaction between uh, gods and humans and gods and gods that the gods, uh, well, entities that might have been just spirits before, but through subjectivation and socialization become gods and create bonds with all kinds of different uh, gods and, and, and humans. And other, as a process, uh, many of these gods seem to be humanized, right? This, they, they behave like humans. They have human names, they have human affects, they uh, tell of their uh, earlier lives as, as living humans and, and so on and so forth. So this is not, this is actually well known, right? The Chinese and it's not only the Chinese did that, many other, many other cultures 
people try to, to tame and control these non-humans by um, making them into humans of some sort. But what I think we see through uh, the analysis of the society of gods and humans uh, through straight writing is that at the same time as the humans humanize entities, spirits, the humans also are integrated in a much larger society where they are just one pool of subjects inter interacting with other subjects whom the humans fully and clearly recognize as being not entirely human or at least having something non-human about them like you know, uh, stellar spirits or you know, animal spirits and, and, and so on and so forth. And I think it's, just, it's through this, this idea of a society that expands through ever uh, more numerous bonds and links between different subjects that keep their individual identity as subjects, but will grow into this 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 ever expanding society that we can understand uh, and how the, the Chinese think about you know, non humans and, and invisible beings in a way that hopefully. Uh, can bring new perspective of our understanding uh, Chinese religious culture. Okay, well, stop. Yeah. thank you um, very much, Vincent. So I think we're we've reached we're a little bit past our uh, target time, but uh, I think that's fine. And uh, first of all, um, thank Vincent very much for this uh, wonderful talk and showing some of the possibilities using this technology as well to to visualize some of this. Um, and uh, what I'd like to um, say for the, uh, those of you who signed on as attendees, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And if you, if you have any feedback just about the, the format that we've tried out today in terms of as we're moving forward to the, you know, until we can get back fully together, but also utilizing this, this other technology for doing uh, kind of hybrid events where we'll have an in-person audience here at Harvard, but also reaching out as we have with this talk to hundreds of people uh, around the world. Um, uh, if you do have any feedback just about the, um, the kind of format or the, uh, the user experience for you of, of doing things today, um, please just uh, send an email to me at, at jrobson at fas.harvard.edu and we'll, uh, we can learn as we go along uh, to try to uh, enhance this experience and think of ways, because uh, I think this is going to be with us for a very long time uh, and we'd like to keep uh, playing around with formats and all of that. So let me, maybe Michael would like to say just a final uh, words as the as the host and chair of this uh, uh, religion seminar and indeed so let me just begin by saying on behalf of Rob Willard myself our huge thanks to Vincent for a truly extraordinary talk where again you are forcing us all to rethink so much of what we thought we knew about Chinese religion so thank you so much for joining us and on all of our behalf thank you to James Robeson and the entire Asia Center for hosting and actively running so successfully this hybrid event, as James has mentioned. I think this is where we are hoping to go with the events going forward, and I think it's worked wonderfully. So our deep thanks to James for putting this together. Of course. Thank you. Great. Thanks again, Vincent. And, and thanks to uh, Tenzin and Hoi for managing it so yes. efficiently and smoothly. And, and hidden out of the camera range, yeah. otherwise we'd have them take a bow. So, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you all again, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully see you again uh, online or in person uh, uh, soon. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.